Hello, everybody, and welcome to the third lecture in the 18th annual UM Alumni Association Community Lecture Series. We're glad to have you all here. Uh, we have a lot of philosophers in the room tonight, so this could be pretty heady, but we'll, we'll all try to hang in there with you guys. Um, I'm very pleased to be here with you. As always, I want to ask you, as always, to turn off your cell phones if you haven't done that yet. Uh, to remind you that we are being um, taped by MCAT and that you will be able to um, watch these lectures on MCAT later on in the spring. We'll be able to let you know the schedule for that by the time we finish the lecture series. Um, and I imagine that there will be DVDs available as well for this series. Is that correct, Angela? Okay, okay, so that, we'll, we'll uh, keep you informed about that and those always take a little bit of time and so on. So uh, maybe let us know if you're interested and we can uh, let you know what's gonna happen. Um, <clears throat> okay, um, so for tonight we have David Sherman. Oh good, thank you for ducking down there. Very nicely done. <laughs> Associate Dean, they lead the way all the time. Go Jenny. Um, tonight's speaker is David Sherman from the Department of Philosophy. Uh, David is not only a wonderful scholar and a wonderful teacher, but I know him as a wonderful community member here on the campus. He's done a lot of service around the university and for his department, and that's something that not all wonderful scholars and teachers um, are willing to take the time and devote the energy to. So um, I have really uh, had a lot of pleasure in my knowing of David <clears throat> during these past years. I'm particularly interested in his, um, in his topic for tonight, which is called Justice in Motion, the Evolution of a Complex Concept. And um, many of you know that I'm a classicist, and so when I think of justice as being a changing or a, a concept in motion, I think of one of the great works of classical antiquity, which is the trilogy, the Orestia, uh, by Aeschylus. Um, and within the three plays of that trilogy, a father sacrifices his daughter because he thinks it's the just thing to do. His wife sacrifices that father, murders that father because she thinks it's the just thing to do. And the son of those two parents kills his mother because he claims it's the just thing to do. So all in all, I'm prepared for David to uh, explain all of this to us to make sure that we leave with a five-word definition of justice at the end of the evening. David, I'm very excited to hear your lecture. Come on over. Thank you. Well, that, personally, it's really a pleasure to be here. I was very excited when I was asked to uh, speak uh, by the Alumni Association, and I thought in particular, this is going to be great because one of my biggest problems is what in dealing with students over the years, the cultural reference go away very quickly. I realized that the first time that I mentioned Captain Kirk and I got this blank stare from my group. And so it, it's constantly an effort. Then I thought, well, with the Alumni Association, no problem. This is a group that's going to understand the cultural reference. The problem is one of their cultural reference, Alice, uh, Garrison Keillor is across campus. And so this didn't quite work out the way I had planned, but thank you for coming nevertheless. Um, my own work, just to briefly put th this talk, uh, to, to frame it properly, I come out of a, a tradition, the European tradition in philosophy, which to me had many strengths and many weaknesses. Uh, what I've taken from that tradition in particular it's, are its methodological commitments. I think some of these commitments are extremely important, and not the least of which is the notion that in some sense 
concepts, ideas unfold over time. I found something lacking in that tradition, however, in terms of the way in which it dealt with some very concrete problems. Problems concerning things like economic distributions, redistributions, and all the rest. And there I found something in the Anglo-American tradition of political philosophy very compelling. So what my own project is broadly, because I've been asked to speak about the things I do, is to try and synthesize these two traditions. And in the way I think about synthesizing, it doesn't mean just bringing them together, but to use a, 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 the translation of a difficult German term, you sublate them. You synthesize them and you go beyond. And this is what I attempt to do with my work. So today, I've come to speak to you of justice, <laughs> uh, which is a wonderful way to open. But one of the ways I, I want to start here is with a, an interesting insight. In, in the recent literature and the proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, they found that children demonstrate a sense of justice at a very early age. Literally two, three-year-olds are really quite remarkable in terms of their innate sense of justice. And this raises all sorts of interesting questions, none of which I can begin to broach here. But of course, we begin with this innate sense of justice, and where do we go from there? One of the things I recognize, at least through my own experiences, is that this innate sense of justice then comes to be, in some sense, shaped by social and cultural matters at a very early age. So from an early period of time, uh, my, my own sense of justice tracks something like this. <laughs> Quite frankly, I, I, I found the one on the right more, more compelling. <laughs> but what is the point here? A rather puerile sense of justice, no? Justice itself is a complicated concept. And one of the things about justice that I want to convey here is that this complicated concept needs to be elaborated in particular sorts of ways, many of which take us beyond this innate sense of justice that we think that we have. And often it's the case that as we start to investigate precisely what justice requires in any particular situation, some of the innate ideas that we have about justice start to become pressed. Just to give you an example I had at a very early age, I remember looking around and s watching someone who was obviously very poor and very hungry stealing food in a supermarket. What filled me was not a sense of injustice, but really at a fairly early age, a sense of shame. And of course, that emotion, could, we could elaborate what that was about, but again, that would take us beyond the talk here. One of the philosophers, stock and tr the stock and trade of philosophers is in some sense conceptual clarification. And once upon a time, I actually thought that I was somewhat dismissive of the notion that, well, is this all that philosophers do? Uh, as I've gotten somewhat older and as I, I've moved through the profession, I've come to recognize that conceptual clarification is something that is frequently called for and is desperately called for. It's what we do. And part of what I want to do today is essentially clarify, at least the way I see it, the concept of justice itself. Now, the, these slides motivate. We'll have to put the Stooges aside. Let's go with Superman. Because the first thing I remember, and I could recite this from heart, uh, at the, when Superman would be introduced at the beginning of the show, what they would tell you at the end of the introduction was, he fought a never-ending battle for truth, justice, and the American way. And let's start with truth, justice, and the American way. Because there's something important here, as strange as it may sound, but not in the way in which it is initially articulated in the introduction to Superman. So one of the things you'll notice here, I've got truth, justice, and the American way in capitals up top. And of course, in the Superman episodes, these things run together seamlessly. There's truth, justice, and the American way. No problem. The American way reflects truth and justice. Justice is informed by truth in the American way. And of course, to get to the truth of the matter is to get to justice and reaffirm the American way. But for almost anyone who's paying attention, that starts to fall apart. 
right? And it's one of the things that started to fall apart for me, and actually at a fairly early age. But I want to talk about truth, justice, and the American way with the capital letters. Then what I want to do is move into truth, justice, and the American way in the lowercase letters, because that's where I think there's something important to stay. Truth with a capital T. This, in some sense, is a manifestation of what philosophers would refer to as a teleological view. In this sense, the idea that whether you're coming from a religious, a, a moral, or philosophical doctrine, that there's some capital T truth that's there for us to capture. And truth itself, with this capital T notion, manifests itself in a variety of forms. As I suggested, it manifests itself in religion. But it also manifested itself in what was antithetical to religion, what was once called by orthodox Marxists dialectical materialism. It too thought it had the truth with a capital T. Many advocates of contemporary capitalism believe that they have the truth with a capital T. And one of the things that I want to suggest to you is that the notion of truth in this sort of sense is deeply problematical when it comes to notions of justice for reasons that in some sense are manifesting themselves in the world today as different groups with different capital T conceptions of truth that dictate capital J conceptions of justice go out and justify anything they do in its name. So, truth with a capital T is deeply problematic. On the other hand, truth with a small t, as I suggest up here, in many ways is crucial for making sense of justice. To use the terms of a great Anglo-American philosopher, Bernard Williams, the kinds of truth I'm concerned with here are what Williams would call plain facts. Now, the capital T truths of religion may be somewhat problematic in terms of f fleshing out justice, but plain truths such as the petty Iraqi tyrant does not have weapons of mass destruction, or plain truths like human activities strongly bear on global warming, these are the sorts of truths that are absolutely indispensable to properly honing our conception of justice. Let's look at the American way. The American way, capital A, capital W. This implies that whatever it is that America, and you can fill in the blank. It could be the blank way. It happens to be the American way here. But you could fill it in any way you want. The, the American way here implies that whatever it is that America does, it ought to be supported simply by virtue of the fact that it is America. This is a fundamentally mistaken notion with respect to the demands of truth. It blithely assumes that whatever America does, it's necessarily just simply by virtue of the fact that America is doing it. And this has basically, it has a number of names, one of which is called conventionalism. But there's another name, it's called exceptionalism. And the very notion of American exceptionalism, which has, is taken for granted by many of the talking heads in our media and many uh, intellectuals, in, for that matter, is fundamentally antithetical to a conception of justice. All right, so that's a problem. Don't confuse capital A, capital W, the American way, with justice. But the American way, small a, small w. What does that mean? Again, you can fill in the blank any way you want with A. We start considering the question of justice from where we are. And where we are is in a particular constitutional democracy, part of a history that has brought us to this point. And so any questioning of justice itself is necessarily going to arise out of the American way, small a, small w. Indeed, where else would it start? for us, given that that, in fact, is the tradition in which we are ensconced. So what I want to suggest to you is, is that both truth, small t, and the American way, small a, small w, do, in fact, bear on or mediate the conception of justice that we are going to try and formulate, right? Now, the forms, of, the forms that justice will assume, in other words, depend on the way in which we relate justice to the plain facts and the way in which we make sense of it in terms of our evolving social, economic, and political structures. Okay, so 
justice. We now know, in some horizontal sense, what bears on justice. What is justice itself? In a very basic sense, what justice is is getting what we deserve. But of course, to, answer, to say what justice is is getting what we deserve is essentially not to answer the question at all. Because then we ask such questions as, well, what precisely is it that we deserve? What criteria do we believe are relevant for making a determination as to what we deserve? But having said that, there, 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 are, there, are, there are certain notions that very much are tied in with justice. In many respects, the watchwords of the, the, the uh, French Revolution, liberté, égalité, and fraternity, are, are frequently tied up with justice, and in particular, the first two, although perhaps problematically. So, I want to start with what's generally considered here the weak leg in, in justice, to the extent that it's considered injustice at all. And that weak leg is fraternity. And again, I, I don't like the term fraternity. I'd happily substitute the notion of solidarity, because fraternity itself has a kind of sexist overtone. But solidarity, I'm not sure quite gets it, because there's something more about fraternity or sorority that even solidarity may not capture. But what is, it, what is this thing that we call fraternity or, sor or sorority? It, does it mean inclusion? Does it mean cooperation? Does it mean empathy? Does it mean having a kind of familial feeling for other people within your polis, right? Now, the notion of fraternity itself can be understood with a capital F or, or a small f, right? Fraternity understood with a capital F is very much like the American way, understood with the capital A and capital W. In other words, you're part of this fraternity. Engage in this hazing process or engage in this war, or to put it simply, love it or leave it. Well, this is a deeply problematical notion, right, when it comes to fraternity. And one that people who I think really understand the term would reject outright. On the other hand, there are other questions about fraternity in a small f way, right? How, how does fraternity bear on liberty and equality, which are unproblematically taken to manifest justice or to be certain questions that, that justice raised, right? In particular, to what extent is fraternity needed in order to constitute a flourishing democracy? And to what extent is a flourishing democracy a necessary condition for facilitating a condition of freedom? Right? These are really important questions. And I think way too quickly, fraternity gets thrown out. Fraternity itself is a deeply problematical notion, especially now. We live within a pluralistic age in which people from very different backgrounds come and cohabitate in, in, in shared geographical spaces. And so, right, we may consider, well, how shall we make sense of fraternity? Is it a sense of solidarity? Is it a sense of recognition? Or to put it in the words of John Rawls, is it, is it basically furnishing the social bases of self-respect? And I think especially these notions of solidarity, recognition, and the social bases of self-respect are extremely important right about now. It goes beyond old notions of fraternity, which presuppose a homogeneity that no longer exists. But I will say one final word on fraternity and then move on. There was, I remember being struck years ago that there, there was this wonderful trilogy by Krzysztof Kozlowski. It was called The Tricolors. It was these three movies about the French, rev about the, the French notions of liberté, equality, and fraternity. And each one explored uh, you know, the particular concept it dealt with. There was one unifying thread. With the notion of liberty, you see this elderly woman struggling to get her garbage into a can. And the protagonist, Juliette Binoche, just walks by. Then with the equality, there is this woman struggling to get her garbage into, in, in, into the bin. And it was Irene Jacob who looks and simply walks by. And then there was fraternity. And I think it was Julie Delphi. And Julie Delphi sees this woman struggling to get the garbage in. 
And she stops what she's doing, she goes over, and she helps the woman put the garbage in the bin. It's hard for me to believe that fraternity, at least in some reconfigured way, has no role to play in justice. So I just leave you with the thought that this may be an underexplored area for philosophers to consider. Where the action is in, in, in questions of justice are generally with liberty and equality. And there's a complicated relationship between liberty and, and equality, right? Um, there are those, it's frequently argued that the cost of equality is liberty, that the cost of liberty is equality. And especially the way in which the issues have been framed in the contemporary political debates, this is an intuition that strikes us powerfully. It's not clear to me that it's right. It seems to me that in many ways, liberty and equality can be best understood as the torn halves of a whole that we aspire to as, as a, a polis, but have yet, not yet been able to realize. Now, in terms of the way in which our politics have evolved, it was the case that in the, in the 60s, early 70s, there was a strong push toward equality. Come the late 70s, and, and especially in, in the early 1980s, going f forward to this point, equality has more or less been subordinated to liberty. It's really only become clear since the 2008 financial crisis and, and, what, and what has occurred in its wake that equality is an enormous problem and has been for us for the past 35 years. Um, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that later. But one of the things I want to point out before mo moving on here is that both liberty and equality themselves must be understood in smaller case letters. Why is that? Nobody even the most ardent libertarianism, and libertarianism is what I'm going to call into question tonight, no one, not even the most ardent libertarian, is going to demand capital L liberty, which is untrammeled liberty. No one's going to, no one asks for that, and not even libertarians. On the other hand, there's no egalitarian who's going to make the argument that we must be equal in some capital E way. That flies in the face of too many sort of intuitive insights about the lack of equality among people. Not in a political sense, but let's be frank. Some of us are better looking, some of us are worse looking, some of us are smarter, some of us are less smart. To not face these obvious facts is silly. Of course, the question is what you do with them and how they then bear on your moral outlook and your moral political outlook. That's an entirely different story. And in that sense, we want to understand ourselves as equals and as having liberty. But again, it's always going to be in a smaller E, smaller L way. John Rawls, who's the most important political philosopher in the, uh, probably in the Anglo-American tradition since John Mill, so we're going back now a very long period of time, he was a strong advocate of egalitarianism with what he called the difference principle. It's unimportant for our purposes, as well as emphasizing called fair equality of opportunity. Having said that, it never occurred to him to demand equality in a capital E way. So what we are talking about are, are liberty and equality, small l, small e. What I want to do now is basically talk about three of the traditions jumping by too quickly and then move into a discussion of the tradition that I really want to take on tonight, libertarianism, precisely because I believe that libertarianism itself has lost sight of the fact that the concept of justice is in motion. Okay, so now we, we, we've got liberty, equality, and, and fraternity. These are the three biggest games in town. I mean, there are others. Um, some I hope we never have to add. Some I wish we could add. I won't go into those. But at least for us, these are the three big games in town. And libertarianism, as this suggests here, and, and, and I'll talk about momentarily, its emphasis is on liberty, often to the relative or absolute exclusion of equality and fraternity. Communitarianism. 
Communitarianism is a commitment to community. You'll notice that I have the line running down to communitarianism. It's halfway between equality and fraternity. What, what is the intuition on that I'm trying to capture here? At the extreme, with a capital C, communitarianism doesn't participate in questions of justice at all. At the extreme, with, with, with the capital B, what a, a capital C communitarian would say is, one does what one's community demands that one do. Full stop. And that questions of justice don't ordinarily arise in that kind of context, right? The idea is what we do is what we should do by virtue of the fact that we're doing it. So notice, this comes from fraternity. Fraternity came from the American way. And this is a capital A, capital W reading of the American way. But having said that, there's something very important captured in the notion of communitarianism with a small c. Because bear in mind, part of the traditions, the customs, and rituals that make up our community includes questions of liberty and equality. And indeed, those people with a really, at least in my view, sophisticated idea of what communitarianism involves, recognizes that the best of communities themselves operate with not simply blind subservience to traditions, rituals, and customs, but a real robust conversation about what these things entail with real robust differences about how we should move the community in this way or that. And I have been privileged to know certain people who are committed to a communitarian view who have taken this idea very seriously and in some senses have actually broken with the communities of which they had been a part for a very long period of time precisely because they took the imperative of justice seriously. And that's got to be part of the story as well. Liberty and equality are part of our traditions. And the great communitarians, the ones we read from, Alistair McIntyre, uh, 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 um, McIntyre recognizes that vibrant communities contest. Charles Taylor represents, recognize that communities you contest issues within the traditions and structures. Okay? So, there's no reason to think that even from a communitarian standpoint, we can't consider questions of liberty and equality. But what we do recognize is we don't consider them ex nihilo. We don't consider them from nothing. We consider them within our well-grounded customs, rituals, etc. Liberal egalitarianism. Liberal egalitarianism, again, and this was, the, this was represented by the position of John Rawls, who I mentioned earlier, has always tried to, in some sense, mediate the relationship between liberty and equality. It's a tough dance. And, but it's not to suggest that it's not one worth trying to make, because there are deep tensions there. In fact, certain libertarians will attack liberal egalitarians for not being liberal enough. There will be egalitarians and people to the left of egalitarians who will attack liberal egalitarianism for not being egalitarian enough. But there's a deep tension. And again, with one of the things that you come to recognize when you move past the Superman conception of justice is that there's a tension between all of our highest values. And that doesn't mean getting rid of any of them, but seeking to adjudicate the tension and adjudicate the tension within the, within the framework of, 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 of where we are. This is how justice moves, or at least ideally from my standpoint. So there are a variety of different liberal egalitarian approaches. Um, I don't really want to go into them. I will tell you, I think that John Rawls's approach is, is superior to any other. There's one kind of liberal egalitarian approach, for example, that, that's represented in the works of people like Ronald Dworkin, which seeks to make some sense out of you know, understanding our, our moral, the, the, the requirements of liber liberty and equality from a kind of market-grounded standpoint. I don't find those overly compelling. There are many people within the liberal egalitarian tradition who do that. But I want to I hold that aside. 
One of the things I do want to mention about Rawls' position, which I find very interesting, without going into his really complex apparatus for determining what our principles of justice are, one of the things I find compelling about Rawls' position is that he recognizes that justice does in some sense evolve. And what we do is we necessarily bring what he calls our considered convictions to the table in order to frame loosely these sort of heuristic experiments for trying to figure out what the demands of justice now are rather than what they once were or what they might be. Again, for me, these questions are always questions that take place within a determinate context. And that determinate context is always now. Libertarianism. This is the political philosophy that has held sway in the United States roughly since the late 1970s or early 1980s when it replaced what was crudely social, you know, social democracy, a, a weak form of social welfareism that in some sense was mildly correlated with a Rawlsian framework. I mean, Rawls's framework was much more sophisticated, but the, 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 there was a sea change and one of the books that facilitated this sea change, ironically, was a book by a fellow by the name of Robert Nozick, who wrote a fairly famous book called Anarchy, State, and Utopia. For those of you who watch The Sopranos, there's an episode in The Sopranos with someone who's reading a, the, a, 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 the Anarchy, State, and Utopia. And it was really a sort of ironic comment on our Anarchy, State, and Utopia. If someone wants to ask me during the question period, I'll be happy to answer it. I, I, I don't want to. I've got 27 minutes. And I've got more to cover. All right. So for libertarians, the emphasis is on liberty, right? And libertarians understand liberty with a capital L. You already get the sense this is not my cup of tea. What is this capital L? One of the reasons that I refer to libertarianism as having a capital L is that from my standpoint, it seeks to hypostatize, to, to pin, to conceptually pin an, a conception of liberty and hold this is what liberty is and this holds across time frames. And again, this is precisely what rubs against my own methodological commitments and I think it gives rise to deep problems, right? Um, my own view is this, I mean, let, 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 let me encapsulate it. By us failing to see that even our highest values, such as liberty, must develop over time, as society itself develops over time, we don't preserve these notions as we refuse to reconsider them in the face of new times, but rather what we do is, by hypostatizing them, by pinning them down, in some way we end up doing greater violence to the spirit that underlies these notions as the times that made sense of the notion leave it behind and we kill, still try to foist the antiquated notion of what this should be on our contemporary time. This is the problem I have with not recognizing that justice itself is a concept that's on the move. To put it in terms that um, European philosophers would recognize, this is of a piece with what the German philosopher uh, G.W.F. Hegel would refer to as the movement of the concept. In libertarianism, the concept, it ain't moving. And I think this has given rise to enormous problems. So what, what, what I want to do for the remainder of this lecture is to discuss libertarianism in particular, the grounds that it gives in support of itself, and try to show why in some sense libertarianism remains a deeply ungrounded political commitment precisely because it claims to ground itself in a particular understanding of liberty and equality that no longer really pertains, at least in the way in which it was initially formulated for our current age. But what I want to emphasize here, lest some of you get the wrong ideas, I'm a big fan of freedom. I'm a big fan of equality. It's not that I'm saying that freedom and equality ought to be rejected because these have become antiquated notions. There are actually some political philosophers who've been making those sorts of claims about liberty, equality, uh, and democracy in the face of growing you know, technology. It seems to me this is a perilous mistake. 
what I am saying is, is that insofar as you want to maintain an, a self-identical notion of liberty or equality going all the way back, and you then take these notions which grew from a much earlier period of time and trying to hang on to them in just that sort of way in the contemporary time, you falsify these notions. In fact, what Hegel once argued, and it seems to me is exactly right, concepts end up turning into their opposites. And what we need to do is we need to always be rethinking our concepts in their time. There's a German phrase, it's called hermeneutics, and it talks about this interpretive task of constantly thinking and rethinking and considering and reconsidering our highest values and how they ought to apply within our current era. In fact, I, and now I'm a bit out of my depth, but I do remember once listening to a, a, a scholar in the history of Christianity talking about the Gospels. It was Matthew, Luke, John, and Mark. And one of the things that Matthew... What, 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 one of the... What, well, one of the things that Matthew, Luke, John, and Mark, if you read them closely, what you recognize is they're all looking how to make sense of the Christian word in their own times. So I think it was Mark who says at the end, render unto Caesar that which is Caesar and unto God what is God. Well, this is someone looking to make sense of his commitments in a certain time and place. And so what I'm really asking you to do is not to give up on freedom and equality, but to recognize that we necessarily consider these things in our time and place. These are always concepts that are in some sense in motion. So let's talk about libertarianism. There are, libertarianism starts, and really in many ways, the demiurge beyond behind our own constitution, the Declaration of Independence, is really the, the, the English philosopher John Locke. And Locke is writing in 1689. And what Locke says, what Locke is doing in 60, 1689 with his two treaties of government is in the first treaty, he's attacking the right of kings, right? And what he's looking to do is to seek the grounds for a secular, or for, for a government in an agrarian society with more land than food. This is important. Sometimes philosophers look at, look, at, look at the empirical as so much flotsam to be gotten out of the story. The empirical is part of the story. To the extent that philosophers seek to give rarefied stories and separate off from the particular facts that have motivated their ideas, their values, and their concepts, be careful. So, what is, what is Locke's position? Locke takes the position that natural rights, right, and he's a natural rights theorist, issue from God. Every individual is marked by self-ownership. The idea here is for Locke, we have rights to life, liberty, and property and the property follows from life and liberty. This may seem vaguely uh, familiar to you, right? Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. The pursuit of happiness was a throw-in because not everyone had a right to property, <laughs> right? So it's a great sound. It, it, almost, it, 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 it seems to, it, you know, it, 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 seem, it seems to give our, our founding a, a sharp utilitarian turn. But really, what, it was a throw-in line because not everyone had property. So. Self-ownership, a strange view of the self-relation where we, in some sense, own ourselves, right? And the idea here is we can alienate that ownership. And so libertarians are famous for the idea that we could actually sell ourselves into slavery because to interfere with that right would be to interfere with the property relation that is us in relation to us. Of course, they've never talked about what government would actually enforce the slave contract after the fact, which also suggests one of the problems here, but we hold that one aside. Now, according to Locke, God gave the earth to humanity in common. We all own the earth in common. And what Locke said was that an individual can appropriate 
parts of the earth to the extent that he or she mixes their labor with them. So for example, and this is a very intuitive, and this is where you always need to be careful when something is too in clear intuitively, step back. If I plant a crop, I will be the first one to tell you, get the hell away from my crop. I sweated, I, I planted the seeds, I did the work. Who are you to come in and take my crop? This seems intuitively obvious. And this, get, and this gets you off the ground. One of the problems is Locke also took the position, not only is it the case that I'm entitled to my crop, but I'm also entitled to all the land in, perpet, you know, in perpetuity by virtue of it being my property that, on which I planted my crop. So simply by planting the crop, I not only get the crop, but I get all of the property too underneath it. It's an interesting notion. This is in many ways what get Lock, gets Locke's story off the ground. Why would I be entitled to pieces of the earth in common? And how in the world does my appropriation of the land underneath the crop not interfere or violate the property rights of the rest of humanity which own this prop, which own this in common. It's a very strange notion. But it's part of what gets Locke's libertarianism off the ground, at least in terms of property. Now, one final point. Locke has this proviso where he says, you are entitled to the land as long as, quote, there is enough and is good left in common for others. And this was not a problem in 1689 in an agrarian society with a lot more land than there was food and seeking to encourage people to produce for purposes of feeding hungry people seemed to be a wise thing to do. It's not clear to me that Locke ever foresaw that this was going to be turned into an eternal principle. At the time, it made a lot of sense. Robert Nozick comes along in... In, 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 the, in the late 60s, early 70s, and writes his masterpiece, Anarchy, State, and Utopia, in 1974, which was really, in some sense, prescient in terms of the turning of the United States away, away from a very mild form of social democracy into a, a kind of, you know, an exemplar of libertarianism. Nozick's position is strangely ungrounded. Unlike Locke, Nozick makes no reference whatsoever to God, so the question is, what is it that's ultimately grounding the natural rights that Nozick wants to offer as well as Locke, right? So that's the first problem. Nozick also recognizes the problem of mixing your labor. This never becomes really clear. But then he looks at the Locke improviso and he says, this is a problem. What does he do? He basically waters down the proviso. He says, because there's not enough in his good left in terms of property for the rest of us in 1974 and even less in 2015. So what does Nozick do? He weakens the proviso and says, well, now it's the case that no longer that there has to be enough in his good to appropriate. Now it just has to be the case that there's enough in his good to use. Then the idea is, is that with the exception of disasters, the problem of enough in his good left to use is never going to be violated because everybody is going to be invariably better off in terms of what they can use now than if we had remained in the state of nature. And of course, the question is, why are we using the state of nature as the reference point or the baseline for determining you know, what, 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 whether we have enough and is good? Because you can imagine all sorts of other scenarios that it would have spun out, including one in which common ownership remained, where there would have been a much higher standard of living. And then that would have been the baseline. And for all we know, that baseline could have been actually been higher than the, the one that we have with the, the private appropriation of property. It's an open question. It's an open empirical question. It's a counterfactual that can't be answered. But the point is, it's not even a counterfactual that he raises. OK? So better off is compared to what? Counterfactuals are problematic. The baseline could have been significantly higher, but none of this is dealt with. So what has Nozick effectively done? He's effectively taken the Lockean proviso and insulated the present state of property holdings under the Lockean natural rights, the argument being that Lockean natural rights are never violated because just by virtue of use vis-a-vis -vis what we would have had in the state of nature, there's always more and enough to use. It's a strange position. All right. 
I want to leave this aside now. Let's, let, 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 let's walk away. The Lockean proviso, at least on Nozick's interpretation, is deeply flawed. Natural rights is one way in which libertarianism seeks to ground itself. Let's look at liberty. Well, what, 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 is it, what is referred to as negative freedom, the freedom from interference. It's frequently associated with, with, with a British philosopher by the name of Isaiah Berlin. But as I, as I suggest here, and again, I have the strange terms indeterminacy or normative cross-dressing, there's, there's, there's a deep problem in, 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 in this notion of liberty, this notion of liberty with a capital L. So, to begin with, one of, you, one of you tells me, you know, I've got this really nice car in the parking lot, and I left my keys in the car, but if you go for a joyride, after your lecture, and I'll be the first one out the door to do the joyride, I'm going to bring you to the authorities. I'm going to coerce you. Has someone interfered with my liberty under those circumstances? Of course they have. I'm being coerced. I'm being told, you have no right to go drive my car. Now, many of you are going to say, well, God damn it, you shouldn't have a right to go and take her car. But this is raising an important point that is not generally well ar articulated. If you're making the claim that I don't have the liberty to go use your car, well, let me give you another good example. It would never take place under American capitalism, but let's go to a land far, far, far away where you have a sociopath running a pharmaceutical company. And the sociopath running the pharmaceutical company says, well, we're charging $5 a pill for this drug that people need to survive today, but we're going to uh, raise the price to, let's pick an arbitrary number, $750. <laughs> and then what I want to do is say, hey, I need to start my own little pharmacy here because I want to help all of these people who, who, who without the drug, are, are going to end up dying. And then I do that. And then all of a sudden, th th this, this sociopath basically brings the coercive mechanism down of the, on the, of the state on me. Why? I, I'm, I'm infringing his patent. Now, has he interfered with my liberty? Sure he's interfered with my liberty. Here's the point. When you talk about liberty or the freedom of interference at the bottom of all of your commitments, as if the notion of freedom or liberty stands unmediated below the matrix of values that you have, rather than being one of the values in that context, then the question becomes, if we don't agree that there are no limits on liberty at all, and we claim there have to be limits on liberty, what are those limits on liberty? And once you start telling me there are limits on liberty, then what you're telling me is liberty isn't our only fundamental value, because we have other values that are just important that entitle us to circumscribe your liberty so that, no, you cannot produce this drug to save these sick people, even though that's going to interfere with your freedom. No, you can't joyride in that car, even though it's going to interfere with your freedom. So this gets us to the notion of what I call normative cross-dressing here. What is the normative cross-dressing? When libertarianism claims it's the fundamental value, but then it tells me that I'm not allowed to produce this drug to save people who, who, who are dying, or I'm not allowed to go joyriding in the car, then what it's really saying is there's some other more fundamental value that leads us to circumscribe your liberty. And in the case of libertarianism, that value is clear. It's property relationships. So what we're talking about here is libertarianism holding itself out as privileging liberty when in fact what it's ultimately doing is privileging property relations, and then the property relations are what determines how liberty should and should not be circumscribed. So this is what I call normative cross-dressing. Now, if it were the case, which it never would be, that in fact there was no normative cross-dressing and there were no other values that were going to limit the value of freedom, then the, we have an indeterminacy problem. So just anything goes? Well, what goes? Can't say. Got to be free. But freedom alone, unmediated by the framework within it, within it's embedded, 
basically leaves us with problems of indeterminacy. What do I do? What counts? What doesn't count? What's free? What's not free? By being unmediated, to use the term I've been using, it actually is utterly indeterminate. It becomes determinate by entering into relations with our other highest values. Finally, I want to talk, a close with, with, with the third justification for uh, libertarianism, the quote unquote free market. I, I, you know, there, there are times, I, 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 I've, said this to, I've said this to my class at times, there are times if I hear the word freedom one more time, I, I just want to, I, I, I want to just punch myself in the head and wake myself up. Because the idea here is, I mean, you use freedom just endlessly in this stream that it, it means nothing at all. And everything is sanitized with the gloss of freedom, right? But are markets really free? What does a free market really even mean? We use the term all the time. And yet we have no real conception of what it means. And we have no real conception of whether our markets themselves are free markets. So let me tell you what a free market is. This is what economists tell me a free market is. What a free market is an, is, is an idealized set of assumptions. What a free market includes is a vast, if not infinite, number of buyers and sellers, none of which can have any effect on the price of a good at all. It involves perfect entry, perfect mobility, perfect entry, perfect exit. Entering in, when, com when prices bid away profits, you leave. So there's perfect entry, perfect exit. It involves perfect information. Any of you who dabble in, 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 on the stock market today, good luck. You're up against the highly sophisticated computers that have it all over you in terms of the relevant information for determining when to buy and sell. And then by virtue of their size, will basically crater markets and make them rise just by virtue of their power. That's not supposed to exist in a free market. You have no transaction costs whatsoever. And finally, and most importantly, there are no externalities. If you run, for example, a petrochemical company and you then pollute like crazy, you have violated a libertarian commitment, namely not to externalize costs. Although I don't have to mention the names, I hope. There are some people today in the political sphere who call themselves libertarians and simultaneously pay all sorts of people to deny climate change who do precisely that. Look at all the important American industries, finance, insurance, pharmaceuticals, energy, telecommunications, transportation, computer operating systems. None of them are remotely free markets in the historical sense in which the notion of a free market is understood. Rather, these are all oligopolistic markets. Not quite monopolies, but they're oligopolies. Very few, ver very few you know, producers who basically determine the nature of the market through either price signaling implicit or explicit collusion. Probably more explicit than we know, although that in some sense is illegal. If you have no, no one enforcing government regulations, people get away with illegal things all the time. And to have people enforce government regulations, guess what? You got to have money, the government spending money to enforce these things. That requires the curse word, T, taxes, right? No, no, no one's enforcing any of this. But, but the idea here is we have all of these idealized assumptions concerning the quote unquote free market. And then what's worse are the people who have generally justified libertarianism on free market grounds, people like Hayek and Friedman, who the one thing they shared in common, incidentally, they were both supporters of, of uh, uh, Pinochet in 1973, which was a democratically elected government in Chile that was overthrown. Uh, there's, there's a whole interesting story there. I don't have time to get into it now. If you want to ask about it on the questions, I, I'd be happy to respond. But the notion here is, is that you've got not only these idealizing assumptions, but what really people like Hayek and Friedman had argued was that the free market itself in libertarianism was justified on the grounds of efficiency. It delivers the goods. Look around today and tell me to what extent you think 
that our economy is delivering the goods for a majority of citizens. And, in, and, right, and, and there are other deep problems as well, because libertarianism itself argues that this is a fundamental un underlying deontological commitment. It's a duty. But if, in fact, you're simply operating on the notion of efficient markets, then as soon as markets show themselves no longer to be efficient, then we no longer have any particular reason to countenance libertarianism because its justification has fallen away. It's a contingent justification. So what I've tried to do here is to show you, with, through libertarianism, that you've got three different justifications for this particular doctrine. All three of these justifications depend on, in some sense, hypostatized concepts. And the problem is, it's not 1689 anymore. We live in exceedingly an exceedingly complex society that's marked by sharing, communication. In fact, they, now one of the models in, 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 in industry is the network model, precisely because much of the way in which we made sense of industrial production as little as 30, 40, 50 years, is, years ago is gone. The point I'm trying to make is we need now to reconsider some of our basic understandings of liberty, the freedom from interference, the freedom of corporations, which are not memorialized as persons in the Constitution, only by the United States Supreme Court, even as they claim to be strict constitutional interpretationalists. Right? What we need to do is basically recognize that these notions are notions that need to be reconsidered in our time. Again, which is no different than what I suggested to you earlier. When people heard Christ's word and they needed to make sense of it in their own time, they made sense of it in their own time. Liberty and equality need to be, and, and, and fraternity, or whatever other term you want to use, need to be made sense of in, in our own time. And the idea here is that I want to leave you with is that justice necessarily, in our conception of justice and its constituents, evolves along with our institutions, it evolves along with our capacities, and the failure to recognize this fact causes us to perpetuate a good deal of injustice in justice's name. Thank you. There you go, perfect time. Okay, so we're going to have um, the usual two mics back here, one on each side, and David, I'll kind of look around and point to people who are sure, sure. have their hands up, and please wait until somebody brings a mic to you before you ask so that everybody can, uh, can hear your question. Okay, so uh, where do we first see a question? Okay, I'm going to call on you. I just want to hear about the Sopranos. State <laughs> <laughs> That's one of my philosophy students. <laughs> What's very interesting is in, in that episode, right, one of the things that Noza claims is that through what he calls dominant protection associations, people are basically going to be insulated against violence from wrongdoers outside the law, outside the dominant protection association, which today Sierra was running. Uh, and the idea was someone, had see, someone saw Tony Soprano commit a crime, and this guy was going to turn state's evidence. He was reading Anarchy State and Utopia. His wife gets off the phone and says, you saw Tony Soprano. As soon as he saw, heard that he, he had, it was Tony Soprano who had committed the crime, he forgot about what he saw. The idea being that neither a dominant protective association nor the state was actually able to protect him against rogue elements, which is one of the arguments that Nozick is trying to make in Anarchy State and Utopia. Yes. Okay, who else has a question? All right. Uh, one of the things that I've always kind of struggled with when it comes to questions of ethics and justice is, like, do you feel that there are uh, things that are fundamentally unjust. I realize that uh, you you see justice as something that evolves over time according to the needs of the society. But for example, would you say something like slavery is always unjust and has been throughout history for as long as uh, it's been an institution? Yeah, no, that it's a very good question. And what what I want to do is. 
let me, let me talk in terms of someone like Hegel who addresses this question. But Hegel talks about Rome, ancient Rome, as being the high point of its time with, with you know, the notion of the abstract citoyen and formalized in, in Roman law. And when Hegel looks back at the Romans, he says something like, you know, we, we don't want to say that Hegel speaks not of justice, but in terms of a, a condition of right, right? Is this, is this a condition of right? And he says, it's not right, but it's valid. So what is his point? His point is, is that this was valid insofar as it represented the high point of justice in its time. Very clearly, from our standpoint, the Roman Empire is severely lacking in terms of justice. But let me give you another example, which I think will make this more intuitively clear. I, you know, I remember in my life, you know, I remember different views of people who were gay. And I thought the society was not particularly fair or not particularly nice uh, to people who were gay. In my wildest thoughts, it never occurred to me that gay people should be married. It didn't occur to me. It wasn't that I would have even had a problem with it. It didn't even pop up on the radar screen. That changed. The society changed. Even an extremely conservative court just found that gay people have the right to marry. And now the society is coming to grips with it. 50 years from now, 100 years from now, they'll look back on us, assuming we survive, and they'll say something like, look at these barbarians. They didn't let gay people get married. And what someone would say is, at the time, there was a certain validity. But there comes to be a recognition that, in some sense, the notion of justice has evolved. And so if you have a historical view of justice, which I do, you're, it's beside the point to try and score points against historical regimes that didn't live up to our standard. But I think, I think the example in terms of gay marriage makes my point. Right? This was not something, and by the way, it would not surprise me in the least. I get, you know, I'll, I'll, my wife and I will watch sort of the, the, the science documentaries on, on, on PBS. And some of the stuff with, with animals is just mind-blowing in terms of how sophisticated. I just look like this. I'm just staring and watch the experiments that are done in the sophistication. Once a, there will come a day where I, it may very well be the case that eating, you know, eating animals is going to be looked at as utterly immoral and barbarian. We're not there yet. Could be in the future. The point is these things are in flux. Does that help? Good. Who else has a question? Um, I was hoping you could elucidate on the uh, overthrowing of the democracy in Chile. <laughs> I'd be happy to. Well, um, in 19, I think this was called the first 9-11 because it happened on September 11th. We don't know what the first 9-11 is. U.S. people in South America, Central America, and in a lot of places around the world, they know what the first 9-11 is. So Salvatore Allende is democratically elected. And by the way, this, this has resonances back home. Because when he was elected, what he wanted to do was essentially not appropriate the copper mines, but take control of them and pay off, I think it was Anaconda, Kennecott, and a number of the other copper companies and say, OK, we'll give you fair value. Leave us alone. We want to be able to administer the wealth of our country for ourselves. So of course, Anaconda and Kennecott go to uh, R.M. Nixon. And basically, what Nixon, in one of the famous lines says to Kissinger, he says, make their economy scream. Here's an example of the free market in action. The United States holds enormous reserves in all sorts of commodities. One of the commodities is copper. It's frequently believed that one of the ways in which Allende was overthrown is with the CIA. And the CIA was most certainly involved. But in fact, the story is much more complicated than that. Because what happened was, what Nixon did was he dumped enormous quantities of copper onto the world market. What happens when you dump enormous quantities of any good on the world market? The price comes down like this. This is exactly what happened in Chile. And it, the, basically, Chile's revenues were cut enormously. 
And then with encouragement of, of, of people who were, I don't want to call them counter-revolutionary because there was no revolution. He had been democratically elected. Basically, there was a coup d'etat. And by the way, uh, to finish off the story in terms of the free market, as it was the case that there were all sorts of people who had been associated with the Allende regime who were taken down to the soccer stadium down the street and had their, blown brain out, blown out, their brains blown out, people like Milton Friedman were flying in from the University of Chicago to give tutelage to Pinochet on how to get prices right in Chile in the name of the free market. Yeah. Um, do you think that uh, Scalia's concept of origin, originalist, I'm not sure um, how it quite yeah. said right, are going to um, last, or will they be buried with it? Right? You know, I, I mean, it depends on the politics, right? I, look, I, <laughs> Scalia, I, I, you know, it, it's, it's, not, it's not nice to speak ill of the dead, they say. But I've looked at his, uh, some of his opinions. I looked at his, his positions in, 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 right, in Bush v. Gore. I looked at his, his positions in a variety of cases. I, sound, I, I found no great insight there. And in terms of his wit, I usually found it to be at the expense of the victims. Um, having said that, look, this is what's going on right now. This is, this is being contested. What will be the, right? There, there are certain segments in society that obviously want to replace him. There are other segments in society that don't. Whether it disappears with, with Scalia or not depends upon the politics. That's why politics still matters. I, I, I mean, just, you know, many people can be turned off by politics, and I mean, God knows they have good reason to be. But I, I remember when I was in the, in the Netherlands, I, I went to the Anne Frank house. Um, and there was, there was a, a letter from Anne Frank's father, who actually had survived the Holocaust. And he said something like, you know, I didn't pay much attention to politics before, and I wish I had. Because the fact of the matter is, whether that dies with him or not, is going to be determined by a politics that is now highly contested which means that everyone is someone who has a stake in this place ought to get involved. It's an open question. <coughs> Thanks, Bob. Albert. Albert, yeah. Um, well, I really liked it. I think it was great. And I just want to uh, suggest uh, a possible alternative to the way you talk about libertarianism, uh, the force that comes in with Reagan, essentially. And uh, I'm wondering if we couldn't see it this way. One might say that the American uh, population has always been torn between equality and prosperity. Equality gives you an assurance, a certainty, uh, uh, the prospect of uh, welfare. But you think, I may be able to do better than equality and become prosperous. And so, you know, so one way in, 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 in looking at the changes and, and the sequence of Republicans, Democrats, Republicans and Democrats is that people uh, sort of go, well, I'm going to take a chance of prosperity. I may be worse off. But, and, uh, and then prosperity is in, in the creation of uh, wealth and property always so obvious, right? So what's next? You know, I want to be like Dennis Washington, or <laughs> close to Dennis Washington, or my private jet. And uh, so, um, is it possible that people sort of mistakenly bet on prosperity instead of liberty, and and what it may? Uh, recommend that notion is that prosperity, at least until recently, is a more animating force than liberty. Right? Mm. Leave me alone. Well, there are times when I want to say that, but I want that toy. I want this jet. I want this ranch. You know, I want this yacht. That I, have. <laughs> I, I, I want that. that, that. Yeah. yeah. And and uh, 
you know, and our culture makes these things so attractive and palatable and seemingly reachable. So, uh, so you know, to, to summarize, it, uh, might it have been prosperity rather than liberty, the search for prosperity that took over? I actually would offer a somewhat more technical response. And, and, and it goes something like this. Uh, and sort of here, 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 here's where, here's where you know, all the commitments come flying out of the pocket, right? Um, I think what really was happening in, in, in the, the mid, look, up in, from basically World War II through, let's call it, the oil shock of, of 73, 74, there was this unprecedented period of prosperity in the United States. And, and this period of prosperity started to break down. I mean, really, what me, most people don't recognize is, in certain ways, already Jimmy Carter was a harbinger of Reagan when he would talk about things like malaise and, and various sorts of, of problems that he, he saw. But, but in the way in which I make sense of it, if you look at the history of, of economic cycles, really, for a very long period of time, and through the 1800s, the 1900s, You've got what they called the business cycle. You would have periods of, of, of boom and bust. And what happened in World War II was really quite extraordinary because there was the destruction of, 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 of much of Europe's industrial capacity. There was, you know, everything had been diverted into the military. And so there's this opportunity for enormous, I mean, there was enormous need and there was enormous production to fill that need. But then, you know, you've, and you plus you have the Keynesian story. And, that cycle starts to wane when you get into the mid-70s, which is about 30 years after World War II. And I really think that many ways, right, you, you were having what was then considered much higher than frictional unemployment. I think under the Carter administration, unemployment was 6 7%, which was unprecedented for, for that period of time. So I think what was going on was, right, and it was this malaise. And of course, what was Reagan's story? It's morning in America. Let's rejuvenate America. There's something new. The idea here was, was that we had been in a malaise that we weren't really in a position to explain. And that somehow the reason for this malaise was that it was something about government that was fettering us. But the fact of the matter is, firstly, I mean, in terms of most people, that period of time, most people were never more prosperous. So really, the idea was, was that the, with, with, with the movement toward libertarianism, that's when you get this arc in which there's greater and greater inequality, which has been continuing over the last 35 years. Now, I do believe that the reason that was able to carry the day in part was because there were enough people who believed the story that notwithstanding the fact that there's very little class mobility, I'm going to be the lucky one. I mean, there's a, there's a kind of optimism that somehow when I, when, when I, when, when I roll the, the roulette wheel, the number, my number is going to come up. And now and again it does. But for every time it, it comes up, there are, in fact, the roulette wheel is grossly understates the odds of hitting it in the way you're talking about it, right? For every time it comes up, there are people who fall lower and lower. There was, an, there was a story told. I mean, there was another story that goes along with, with this as well. Um, it was before Lewis Powell had become a member of the Supreme Court. He was working for the, the Chamber of Commerce. And there was that famous letter that he had written where he said, really, he had this cross as Ralph Nader at that point, right? And the idea was that basically the right had to mobilize. Corporations had to mobilize. And now what's happened over the last 30 or 40 years has just been an onslaught of, of power, you know, hard, a lot of money funding all sorts of think tanks, the telecommunications, which is really an oligopoly if there ever was one, where the message keeps getting beaten down that somehow your liberties are being taken away from you. And so for me, this is a, there's also a, a large part of propaganda here. When the right started to realize that many of the challenges of the 60s couldn't, couldn't be let stand. And so there's a fundamental reconstitution of its own position, both on ideological grounds and, and, and on economic grounds. When Volcker basically crashed the American economy in the last days of the Carter administration and interest rates went up to 
That was basically getting it right for the purposes of the banks. The irony is it tells you in the story of the Times how bizarrely skewed it's become that Volcker has now become a moderate voice to try and limit the financial industry in some ways when he was the guy in some sense that opened this era with 19% interest rates. So I think there's a more complicated story. I mean, I would also point out that I think for any of you who really want to get a sense of these sorts of things, read, read, read Piketty's book, Thomas Piketty's book, Capital. The book is, it, it's, it's this big, it's statistically dense. But what he shows quite convincingly is that capitalism generally tends toward greater and greater inequality. And that the post-war period of time was not the rule, it was the exception by virtue of the extraordinary circumstances that had occurred Right, from the Depression, which sort of shook out the economies, and then the, the, the need to mobilize and fight World War II. This was a historically unprecedented confluence of events. But when you look at Piketty and he shows societies and relative inequality over the last couple of hundred years, what he convincingly shows is that capitalism itself tends toward greater and greater inequality. The point is a lot of people are disenchanted today because they believe that in some sense the, the, the American dream is now beyond their reach. And they're rightfully disenchanted because it is. But the point here is, is this is not the anomaly in terms of these social and economic structures. This is the return to the norm. And I think this is a really important lesson. I'm not sure I agree with all his prescriptions. I'm not sure simple taxation gets at it. But there's a deep underlying structural story to tell here. Does that? So you, go ahead. David, thank you. Um, I've enjoyed the talk very much. Thank so you. just a, so an old friend of mine from grad school, over the years, he somehow migrated to the point where he takes libertarianism seriously. Not a libertarian, but he takes it really seriously. He reads all the blogs and so on. So I, I keep in touch with this guy. I'm constantly being challenged by the most intelligent version of the libertarian objection. Right? And, and um, one point that he presses a lot is that most of these regulations, we make, we, we put regulations in place in a very unempirical way, and a lot of them don't end up accomplishing what they're to accomplish, and it's, it's effectively like, oh, there's inequality, the solution is to set some of Charles Koch's money on fire, right? It doesn't accomplish anything, it doesn't shift the money, it just makes it, it makes the economy not grow at the same rate, right? So, um, on the other side of the coin, you didn't talk about the difference principle very much, but there's, of course, a huge number of empirical questions that are very vexed that surround that. There's no question. Right? Yes. And what I'm wondering is what you think about that, that, that. So clearly, even if we're not libertarians, they're not completely wrong. Markets do something. Use right? the mic. Use the mic. Oh, you can't do it. Sorry. Mar markets do something. Right? Markets do something. We, we can agree to that. Um, so for instance, we might think that our quality of life, in some ways, is accounted for by markets. Um, so how do we begin to approach these extremely vast empirical questions that surround how we make these determinations, right? Because again, we, we don't want to be libertarians, but they're not completely wrong. So what, right, and there's sort of the coin, the difference principle, it's the same problem that we have all these incredibly vast, impossible empirical questions. No, I, look, I, I, but, but no, notice what you've done. You've shifted the terrain to the empirical questions. This is really the kinds of questions we, we should be asking. Now, look, there are certain throwaway lines that, you, that, that, that libertarians use. In fact, uh, someone used it in, in one of my classes. The, notion, the first notion is, well, if there wasn't the government, then all of these bad things that libertarians seem to be doing wouldn't be done. In other words, the government made me do it. And of course, th this, this is nonsensical. And, and I think those things are easily refuted. But, no, th th there's no question about it that, that there are deep empirical and, and problematic empirical questions concerning precisely you know, the right sort of approach. And, and I don't even begin to claim that I have a, a, an answer to it. He here, here's my intuition. My, in my, my intuition is, is that when you're talking about the kinds of in industries I, I ticked off, like pharmaceuticals, like, like, like finance, like insurance, that when you're talking about what once were referred to as natural monopolies, that was a good term. They are natural monopolies. And by virtue of their size and their tendency toward concentration, these are the sorts of things that ought to be accountable to the people and owned in some. I mean, Bernie Sanders is not a socialist. I'm a socialist. Because I real I mean, Bernie Sanders is simply offering New Deal liberalism. I have seen nothing that deviates from classical New Deal liberalism. 
the argument I would make is, is that there are certain kinds of industries that are so fundamentally indispensable, and I think we can marshal good empirical evidence for it, that are so fundamentally indispensable toward a well-functioning democracy which requires well-functioning citizens, that these are the kinds of industries that ought to be accountable. But having said that, there are all sorts of other you know, places in which markets are just great. When I sort of toddle around town and I go to my coffee shops and I go to my restaurants, I have no desire to see these things publicly owned. I mean, I, 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 think, I think there are certain, there's a certain story to tell. But none of this addresses the difficult empirical questions, although the way you phrased your libertarian friend's questions, those, it seems to me, were easy enough to answer. Because no one was looking to set Coke's money on fire. What people are looking to do is sort of put money in the schools in Detroit where you have people who are not going to have any opportunities at all by being by virtue of being in a horrible place. And this is where Rawls is not so bad, although the difference principle is deeply problematic. Is how yeah. empirical a question is just Sorry. Can, yeah. Maybe you can chat with David a little bit later on. We've got a couple of other There's a lot too. There's a lot of it that is empirical. Okay. And that's what I would agree with you. Um, I was curious. I, I noticed in conservative and in libertarian dialogues that you see the term justice being interchangeably used with the term fairness. Uh -huh. And I was wondering if maybe you could maybe briefly speak to that, especially if you yourself notice that, and especially within this paradigm that you're presenting with to as a justice as a term or a concept in motion. Yeah, no, that's a good question. Um, John Rawls, in his theory of justice, refers to his theory of justice as justice as fairness. Indeed, that's the moniker he, moniker he uses to, de to describe his conception of justice. I mean, the interesting question, and it's something I would have to think about, to what extent do we speak about justice in ways that would go beyond fairness? I'm not sure. Um, I mean, it's, some people believe that justice simply is fairness. Um, I'm not willing to say offhand that the, the, the two terms are coextensive. What I would say is they do go a long way down the road together. And insofar as there are deviations, those deviations I have not yet thought about. Uh, but I don't, in principle, reject the idea that there are times that justice may require something that may not be fair. And the reason, in part, is because the two terms mutually inform one another. What is it that we generally think is fair? It's usually tied in with our conception of justice. Aristotle had, had a conception of, 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 of of, of justice where people get what they deserve, they, they get what their worth is. And so there were, there were great disparities in equality because the only people that should get equal were equals. Matt, Matt, Matt's looking a little bit perplexed, and, and this is our Aristotle scholar, so I, I may be here a, a bit on thin ground, but this is what I seem to remember from, from Aristotle, that like people get like. But in terms of the rest, unlike get unlike. The very, the, the very notion of fairness changes over time. And with that notion of fairness change, I think justice changes as well. So I think part of the problem in separating out the two terms is that they seem to mutually inform one another so tightly in terms of, of our pre present conception of it. It's not clear to me what justice means without fairness or what fairness could mean without justice. I, 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 it's a good question. I'm not sure I can give you a better answer than that. I'll think about it. Yeah. I, I guess I would agree with the discussion that says that sometime around 1980, as, as Piketty would say, as you said, as Albert said, that is sort of a turning point. But I wouldn't put the driver as a change to a libertarianism philosophy or the election of Reagan. I think those are secondary things. To me, the main driver of the last 35 years is globalization. And the winners and losers of globalization leading to the current inequality, and of course that's what the current election is struggling with, is, is, is how, how you deal with the inequalities created by, by globalization. So I, I'm, I'm not willing to concede that the last, that libertarianism is in the ascendancy the last 35 years. I mean, we've, had, we've had Reagan, we've had Bush, but we've also had Clinton and we've had Obama, and I, I, I don't, yeah. I don't see, I don't concede that that libertarian philosophy has has won the day, mm -hmm. but the situation we're in is driven, I believe, mostly by 
globalization, which is sort of independent of, of, of that. So, so let, me, let me address what you're saying, because I, I agree in part and I disagree in part. I think, firstly, there's no question that globalization, and just as important, technological change, has had an enormous impact on, on, on people's fortunes. Now, having, so in, in that sense, I agree. I'll, I'll come back to that part of it momentarily. Now, you mentioned Clinton, you mentioned Obama. Clinton and Obama have been functioning within the dominant paradigm, which I think has been the movement toward a kind of libertarian position in the early 80s. Dwight Eisenhower once stated during, in the mid to late 50s, he said something like, we're all Keynesians now. And he would have no truck with people who were breaking from the Keynesian paradigm. I mean, even Nixon, in some sense, was a Keynesian. I mean, you know, he had wage and price controls, right, to, to deal with various sorts of problems. And Nixon had a, a fairly, you know, robust government presence in the economy. On the other hand, Clinton was very much a libertarian. Clinton was the one who deregulated the financial industry. Clinton was the one who ended more or less aid for families with dependent children, who ended welfare as we know it, as he put it. Uh, and, and in a wide variety of other ways, Clinton pushed what was called the neoliberal agenda. The neoliberal agenda was a libertarian agenda. Obama has compared his economic positions with Dwight Eisenhower's. And in fact, when Barack Obama came into power, even before he landed in the presidency, the first thing he did was he went and picked all of the deregulators in the Clinton administration to be his economic advisors. So all of these presidents, whether Republican or Democrat, have been operating within a particular neoliberal paradigm. I mean, my great disappointment was I thought that 2008 was a possibility in some sense to end that paradigm in a particular sort of way. And not only did it not end, but I take it to be the case that Obama essentially reinstantiated it. Uh, Dave, but, I think we're going to have to stop. It's about time now for us to go. So can you continue your, your discussion? Thank you very much, Dave.